that's a shame because you don't have the right frame to appreciate what you're about to experience right now. So, the Professor, Professor Steve Key, author of Debunking Economics, who has a number of books with him, which you can purchase from the, you're going to be in the, in the exhibitor space yeah, yeah. later on. So it's a limited number, 20 pounds each, signed copy, and it's cheaper than Amazon. So they can do incentives to see him after this. So that's, um, that's the setup afterwards. Now you're going to get your little free bit of content, uh, and that's the upsell, okay? So Professor Steve King, please tell us, can cryptocurrencies be money? Okay, well thanks. It's actually a rather different audience to the last one I spoke at, which is about 400 uh, delegates to the United Nations Commission on Trade and Development, all wearing suits. I was the only person there in casual clothing. So <laughs> nice to get the contrast. Uh, and what I want to do is talk a bit about money and the nature of money and how it compares to what cryptocurrencies currently are. But I think I don't know much about cryptocurrencies. I'm still learning. This is a learning experience for me, and I want to get a lot of discussion back from you as well. But I think there's a lot of myths about the nature of money that are part of how the cryptocurrency world has been formed, and I want to clear some of those up. So we, we, the myths aren't the fault of the, of the cryptocurrency community itself. It's the fault of conventional economists, because they've built their entire set of theories on a bunch of myths. So Adam Smith, uh, writing back in you know, 1776, talked about the division of labour as the source of value. That itself is wrong. Uh, but having said that, he said that we have this propensity to truck and barter. Emphasis on barter. And uh, made the comment about saying uh, it's common to all men to barter. It's never been found with any other species. Nobody ever saw a dog make a fair and deliberate exchange of one bone for another with another dog. Okay. Trouble is, when anthropologists are looking to find humans doing that, they didn't find any examples of humans doing it either. So, um, th but nonetheless, this vision that, that we barter became the foundation of how economists think about trade, how trade actually occurs in the economy. And they just treat money as a veil over barter, and the idea is, well, it's, things look better if you lift the veil, you ignore money, money's just seen as a way of making barter easier, and all their models, uh, particularly their models of the macroeconomy, have no role for bank debt and money, which I think is absolutely absurd. But that's, once you drink the Kool-Aid of believing that theory, that's the sort of nonsense you can start producing. Which is no wonder why they didn't see the financial crisis coming. Now, in the last 20 years, there's been quite a bit of work by anthropologists using this idea of barter as a guide. Well, they should be able to go back in history and find examples of barter. They should be able to find primitive communities now, like in the New Guinea highlands and places like that, uh, in the uh, Amazon basin, where barter actually occurs. And they found nothing. The best book summarising this is by David Graeber, and he says it's, it's a, the founding myth of our economic relations. It's so deeply ensconced that everybody thinks that way, even in remote countries like Madagascar, which he spends a fair bit of time in. He said there's no evidence that it ever happened, and an enormous amount of evidence that it didn't happen. And the definitive uh, work on this by an a <coughs> anthropologist in Cambridge ended up by saying there's no example of a barter economy has been found. There are examples of barter, but not examples of an entire economy based on barter. And she said, all available ethnography suggests there has never been such a thing. So if you're trying to build a model based on the idea of let's make it work like a really good version of barter, it's never been tried. So good luck. Okay. Uh, there were some instances where it's been found. They normally were between tribes that would otherwise be at war with each other, but needed to exchange on the periphery, highly stylized, highly ritualized. Uh, but there's no societies that were based on barter. And David's explanation was, this is David Graeber speaking here, not me, that in that sort of society, given that the examples of barter were found were where there were ritualised ways of doing exchange to prevent warfare breaking out between neighbouring hostile tribes, is that any society that was actually based on barter itself would be similar. We're about to kill each other. We manage not to do so forever. We're not talking about America, obviously. Uh, so he said, but it does occur. I mean, I imagine people have been here to be to machine uh, component swaps meetings and things like that. They do happen. Um, but they're, in that case, they're things where you're not going to have an ongoing relationship. Once you've swapped a motherboard for a, you know, a GPU unit, you're not going to see the person you did the swap with again. It's not a society. And intriguingly, one of the, one of the classic examples of an ancient civilization is this island called Yak. Um, you think the name is a joke, but it's actually genuine. Tiny, 100 square kilometres. Today's population is about 11,000 people. Got, I don't know what it was back when it was first rediscovered 
in the late 1800s. But that was somebody where the, the, the economy simply had three commodities, which seems ridiculously simple. Fish, coconuts, and sea cucumber. That was it. Exciting life, eh? I imagine they did other things in their spare time apart from eat. Uh, now, the anthropologist looking at this back in the 1800s thought that it would have to be simple barter. There's only three commodities. In fact, it wasn't. It had a monetary system. And the monetary system, which is quite crazy, when you, when you think of how on earth did this happen, but it worked, there were stone wheels between one foot and 12 foot in diameter. Okay? Those were the coins. That was the currency. Now, of course, you didn't move the damn things. They were too damn heavy to carry. The biggest ones took about 20, 20 people to move, physically move. So you simply make an exchange, allocate part of that fay to the person who's done the, done the sale, and it would stay in the same spot. One of them even fell off, fell off the coast, fell out of the boat. It's just a couple of hundred, you know, maybe 50, maybe 100 feet below sea level. They still use that as part of their currency system. It must still be there. Let's just use it. So it's actually a, it's a credit system, and it's based on trust. And again, the points that the <coughs> anthropologists make, the economists haven't got a clue about this stuff. It's the anthropologists who are doing the good work. This is, again, more from David Graeber, saying that even gold is based on trust because a gold coin is, can only be used as a coin. You can melt it down and make it into part of a circuit board if you want to, okay? And maybe gold teeth and enamel, etc., etc. But as a coin, it's only used as a coin. <coughs> so the only way it works is, is if you trust somebody else will accept it. So even gold is based on trust. And in some ways, what you've got with the Bitcoin, of course, is an attempt to build a trustless network, which again has never been done. So I'm not complaining about innovation, but don't think you're modelling the actual nature of money by bringing it out. Now, the idea of trust is where I think our societies have gone massively wrong, because we evolved in communities that maxed out at about 150 people. And in fact, this, this was discovered in reverse. So a, 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 I think he's a biologist in this case, worked out the concept of a Dunbar number, his, his name is, I think, Robert Dunbar, by saying, well, how many relationships can we keep in our brains given the size of our cerebral cortex? And how does that relate to the size of chimpanzee tribes and bo bonobo tribes and so on? And he did a calculation that, it, that said that given the, the, the cranial capacity of these different species, given the size of the human brain, he expected it to be about 150 people. Now, unlike an economist's prediction, <coughs> anthropologists went out to research this and they found, yes, most early societies maxed out at about 150. Now, the reason is simply that these societies were not, they were not barter economies at all. That's obviously ruled out. So how did they exchange things? It's mainly reciprocal gifts. Think about your own family. Okay? You never barter. You don't barter at Christmas. You give each other stuff. It might be crap, okay? <laughs> but you give it to each other. And you soon pretty well work out who's going to be a stingy person giving gifts, and you attenuate how much you'll give to that particular person. And you've also got to be aware of you know, how everybody relates to everybody else. What you get is the number of two-way interpersonal relations you have to keep track of in your mind when you're part of a, a society, and these are very intense societies, by the way. When you've got a tribal relationship, you really know people extremely well, and it really matters to be able to trust who you've got with you in the dangerous circumstances that would have existed in, uh, in Cro-Magnon times. The number of relationships is you know, factorial, but it comes out to being roughly n squared divided by 2. So if you have 150, you've roughly got 10 or 11,000 relationships to keep in your mind. That's partly where our brain power came from, actually having to do that in the very cooperative societies, cooperative competitive societies we were part of. Now, when you got beyond that scale, we started getting sedentary agriculture and you could expand the number of people that were in a society, then that role of saying who owed who what the records of it were kept largely by the religious authorities who evolved into the state. So you look at the early Sumerian civilizations, they're a combination of religion and state all in one. We worry about the separation of church and state today. It, was, it didn't even exist back then. And they kept the records. And out of that is how basically banking evolved. Now, to know how money works and how it doesn't work today, the last person you're going to ask is a mainstream economist. Because they, they have built models which completely exclude money from their thinking on the basis that it's just a veil over barter. If that were true, you could ask them about money and they'd tell you something sensible. But they simply can't even explain why money exists. There are plenty of academic papers by many mainstream economists wondering why money exists. How does it come about? Why do people hold it, etc., etc.? 
Um, and I'm one of the, I'm not the only one by far, there's a fairly substantial community of critics, but I'm now leaving the, the university sector because economics textbooks have ruined the university sector because bureaucrats think the economic systems theories tell you how to run, run systems well, so everything's better if you can do this, you know, the magical supply and demand. That's been imposed on first-year student numbers in university and that's ruined the student intake to universities that used to offer positions for people like myself. So I'm going out on Patreon and being crowdfunded in the future. But I want to take you to where you can find some decent work on the nature of money. And as well as the anthropologists talking about it, there are also some groups of non-orthodox economists who did likewise. They call themselves circuitists because they talk about a monetary circuit. And this is the classic paper by Augusto Graziani, The Theory of the Monetary Circuit. His mathematics is wrong. He makes some, has some errors in stock flow analysis and so on. But his verbal idea, I think, is quite brilliant because he said... You need three conditions for money. The first is that it, you must be using a token, otherwise you're in a barter system. If you're actually using a good anybody can produce, that's, not a, that's just one more commodity in a commodity transaction-based system. So it can't be a commodity. It must be a token. Let me point this token is now a, a sheet of paper. He's writing back, by the way, back in the days when checkbooks were the common way for transactions. So when he was paper currency, he means using checks drawn on a bank. That's the first condition. The second is it has to be final payment. You can't hand somebody your cheque, they accept the cheque, the cheque doesn't bounce, <coughs> maybe the bank folds before you take the money out, that's your problem. Okay? It's a final settlement, it's not credit. So that's the second thing. And the third is this doesn't apply to government. Government can print its own money and spend it on its own ways, talking really about private banks here, but it can't grant right rights of seniorage, meaning a bank can't just go and print some money and go and buy a couple of buildings. A bank is going to make a bank's going to make a profit. It's got to be out of a profit on the interest margin that it charges and the money creation it does. So Graziani's summary summary was that uh, in this situation, the only way it can satisfy that is by having the settlement made by promises to pay the third agent. So you are, rather than the two-person, two-commodity barter model that mainstream economics has shoved into our brains, which is wrong both historically and logically, what Graziani talked about is a triangular system. You have a buyer and a seller and a bank that records a transfer of money from one to the other, money being liability of the banking sector, <coughs> pardon me, to one of those individuals, and they accept that, trans that monetary transfer as a justification for the physical transfer of the goods. Okay, so that's the fundamental nature of money. <coughs> Think about a set of interlocking triangles. And by the way, I built a software package to model this now, and this by far was the most important paper for me in understanding the actual logical construct of money. So banks are a trusted third party. Of course they've got trusted and in inverted commas. Okay, they should be trusted. Uh, but one of the big dangers you can give to anybody, and you're seeing that in your own community now, of course, is give anybody capacity to create large amounts of money, whatever form that money takes. A couple of other points of clarification. Who's opposed to fractional reserve banking? Okay, it doesn't exist, so you can put your hands down. It's a myth. Okay? And so is the idea of the money multiplier. They are both mainstream economic models of how money is created. And believe me, once you know that it's a mainstream model, you know it's wrong. Okay? Um, the Bank of England, and I'm, I did, never expected to be so fond of, of central banks as I am of the Bank of England, but in 2014, out of the blue, they published this paper called Money Creation in the Modern World that supported the work that I was doing and a whole lot of non-orthodox economists before me for the last 40 or 50 years. So rather than having to cite each other, and nobody knows who we are, we can now cite the Bank of England, and of all things, now the Bundesbank has come out saying the same thing. So all the textbook models are wrong. When you actually look at them in accounting terms, there's one possible way it can be done... Um, in a, in a off-balance sheet basis, but if you try to do it at the balance sheet level, you violate accounting. That's a bit like having a model of biology which violates uh, bio biochemistry. You know, cyanide is good for you type thing. It's just not going to happen. So that, that, is a, that is a myth. The reserves exist because they're used by, by banks to settle their accounts. If I bank at Barclays and you bank at Lloyd's and you pay for one of my books, copies of the book up there by a bank transfer, as well as you transferring money from my account, your account to my account, there's got to be a transfer from Lloyd's to Barclays as well, okay? And that's what the reserves do. They're like oil in an engine rather than fuel, which is the way mainstream economics treats them. And they're also there in case there's a panic by the household sector. 
if you look at the American um, reserve requirement rules, they are that 10%, if people know that 10% is the is reserve, res, required reserve ratio, as it's called in America, only they don't know that it's 10% of household deposits. There's no reserve requirement whatsoever for corporate deposits. And it's also, I think it's a 45-day lagged requirement. So you can be vi in violation of it for 45 days before you have to balance it out. And the bank... The bank will, the central bank will lend to you if you need their reserves because the last thing they want to do is have a bank fail because it doesn't have enough reserves. Okay, so the whole idea you control the banks using reserves is just nonsense. So my work has been largely formalising the work of a guy called Hyman Minsky. Who's heard of Minsky? Believe me, I wouldn't have got that number of hands up ten years ago. Who's heard of Ponzi? Yeah, okay, you, there was a Ponzi talk over in the corner there a short while ago. <laughs> Uh, now, the fundamental insight that Minsky had was is capitalism, he said, is inherently flawed. In other words, the booms and busts we see aren't just an accidental thing or some bad mistake or exogenous shock, which is the way the mainstream model it. It's an inherent part of the system because he said the instability you get in capitalism is due to the financial sector's characteristics that it has to possess to be consistent with full-blown capitalism, it will both generate signals that give you an accelerating desire to invest and it will finance that investment as well. And the two together will cause a crisis. Now, that says that the main weakness of capitalism is actually its main strength. Because innovation is the major thing you can say in favour of capitalism versus almost any other pre-existing social system. Uh, and that social system has given us the technology we're talking about today for one thing. But you'll have a desire to invest which exceeds the earnings you have. You'll have to borrow that money or issue shares. Something will give you an, an obligation to somebody else. That adds, will add to the financial sector's claims on the real economy. And those claims can overwhelm the real economy. And I'll show you a simple illustration of how that happens using a, a simple model derived from complex systems logic. Uh, I think I've got the basic, let's see. So what I, what I derive this model, all I do is define things that are true by definition. The employment rate, how many workers have a job divided by population. The wages share of GDP, total wages divided by GDP. The debt ratio, debt divided by GDP as well. So they're simple, strictly true definitions. That's why I've got the identity sign there. The profit rate, our profit minus is output minus wages minus interest payments. And a profit rate, just dividing that by GDP. And then I'm making an incredibly simple assumption of linear behavioural relations. So a linear relationship between the amount of factories installed and how much output is produced, a linear investment function, capitalists invest more than their earnings past a certain rate of profit and less than their earnings below it, a linear reaction by workers to the employment rate, then amount wage rises above a level of employment except cut wage cuts below, and straight linear depreciation. So it's very hard to get a simpler model than that. And when I put it in mathematical terms, those are the three system states. If I was giving you a serious lecture, I'd explain it, but I'll just leave that sitting on the board for the moment. And when I simulate that model, I get two possible outcomes. So let's take a look at that. If I get my mouse to work. Okay. And this is the classic thing about a complex systems model. So I'm starting this model off with uh, a low level of desire to invest by capitalists. And so I'll slow the simulation down a bit. And you can see, if you watch the plots that are going on there, they're clearly heading towards equilibrium. Okay. I'll speed it up a bit. And that's the sort of world that neoclassicals would like to believe we live in. They don't actually understand this world because it's dynamic and non-equilibrium. But that's the sort of world they think we live inside. You can see the debt ratio is stabilising there, etc., etc. Now, if I just change the model by making capitalists more willing to invest, it starts looking very, very similar. And in fact, it's stabilising more rapidly. But notice there's diminishing cycles there. And now there are rising cycles. In other words, you get a great moderation before a great recession, which is the reality we went through in the last 25 years. I designed this model in 1992, by the way. So before, not just the Great Recession, but also the Great Moderation with more complicated functions. But this is showing several things which are vitally important about the actual real world, more so than I expected when I wrote the model. First of all, there's a moderation before the crisis. Okay? If you see that happening, rather than the moderation being a sign of good things to come, it's a sign of a, pre of a 
subsequent crisis coming your way. There's increasing income inequality because even though in this model I've got the firms borrowing money to build factories, workers just simply receive wages, what actually happens with the distribution of income is the wage level falls over time and the share going to, work to bankers rises. So it's actually workers that pay for the high level of debt, not the capitalists, even though the workers are doing no borrowing at all. So we have rising debt causing rising inequality, and that's a major reason why I think things like cryptocurrencies have evolved, because you are all critical of and cynical of the financial system for good reason, but not necessarily understanding what the reasons are as to why it malfunctions. So you get this rising debt ratio, as I showed in that last little uh, slide, that actually causes rising inequality. And this is what's called an emergent property in complex systems. And I did not expect this. This is not pre-programmed. It simply came out of the, in the underlying dynamics of the model. So you have a constant profit rate, even though the capitalists are the ones doing the borrowing. What's happening is their share of income is remaining roughly constant because the increasing amount going to bankers is offset by a falling amount going to workers. So it's the workers who suffer. And again, that's partly why I've got an audience like this rather than an audience of millionaires. Okay. Rising banker share leading ultimately to a crisis. And uh, if I put in a more complicated model, that was a very simple model with linear behavioural functions and only with um, um, no price dynamics. If I include price dynamics, and neoclassicals think prices solve everything. But what I get out of this is a period of deflation followed by a crisis. I'll speed this one up as well. So this is the sort of stuff I'm building uh, in my free time now that I'm no, no longer going to be a university academic and actually do, can do worthwhile work. So anyway, I'll let that one stop there and come back to it later. So what we saw in the real world, and this, I did not expect this, I must say, when you do a model, even though I was trying to model the real world, to see the real world behaving just as much as my model as it did was quite a shock. The red line is the level of debt in America from 1950 to, to now. And you can see the rising level of debt, which is denominated in dollars, of course, and I define credit as dollars per year, the change in debt. So the red line is dollars divided by GDP. The blue line is dollars per year of new debt divided by GDP. And you can see the little red line you can just make out there, that's zero. So anything below that credit's actually negative. Now, it wasn't negative from 1950 through to 2007. And then the crisis hit and it went from 15% of GDP to minus 5. And that's what caused the crisis. Mainstream economists completely ignore this data because according to them, the level of debt doesn't matter. Same thing happened in the UK, only it's stunning the impact that Maggie Thatcher had. Watch. So from 1880 to 1980, the maximum level of debt never hit 75% of GDP. Two years after Maggie's in, she deregulates the mortgage market in particular so-called big bang, all the, all the uh, deregulation is supposed to unleash, unleash capitalism, what it did was unleash the financial sector. And you went from a debt level, and when that actually change occurred, it was 55% of GDP. When the crisis hit, it was 190% of GDP. And you can see the same basic story. There were plenty of periods of negative credit in the, 19, in the 1880s up to the Second World War. From the Second World War on, pretty much there's almost no periods of negative credit until the crisis hit. And the change in credit actually drives economic performance. So here I'm showing a correlation of credit with the unemployment rate. According to mainstream economics, that should be zero. It's actually a correlation of about minus 0.6. <clears throat> it's minus 0.9 in the American case. The same story happens when you take a look at uh, change in credit and change in unemployment, about a minus 0.7 correlation. They ignore this stuff. I've given up making presentations to economists on this front. They simply don't see it because it's a bit like a Ptolemaic astronomer being shown the moon by Galileo and seeing craters on there and refusing to believe the craters existed because that didn't fit their theory. Okay. That's the level of ignorance we have in the economics profession. It also drives house prices. So a huge part of why housing is unaffordable for your generation is this gigantic increase in household debt. It went from 30% of GDP when Maggie took over to 95% of GDP shortly after the crisis and house prices you can see rising all the way through. The real correlation is change in new mortgages change, drives change in house prices. And again, that correlation is supposed to be zero according to conventional economists. It's about 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So the logic, what's actually going on here? What's driving this behaviour I'm showing you? Well, capitalism is a profit-driven system. I'm sure most people in this room would like to be making a profit. 
And the rate of investment depends upon the rate of profit. Profit is net of what's left over after you pay wages and interest. An investment, when it takes off, will lead to rising debt, so you're borrowing more money to finance the investment, which means you've got a rising amount of money going to bankers. Ultimately, the boom is such that workers start to get a bit of a wage rise as well, and when they do, that reduces profit, and the fall in profit leads to investment slumping. The economy goes into a slump, and it will be restored to the same profit rate when wages have fallen sufficiently relative to GDP to restore the profit rate, but you'll start again with a slightly higher level of private debt than you had beforehand and a slightly lower share going to workers. That's what's actually driving the whole, the whole dynamic. And that's showing you can have a crisis in capitalism even if you got rid of fraud. There's no fraud in this model. There's no Ponzi finance. If I add them in, I get a worse situation. That's called the real world. So this is all the backdrop to the emergence of Bitcoin in 2008. And the question, and I'm asking a question here, I'm not giving a definitive answer, but you know, can Bitcoin overcome those sorts of deficiencies of credit money and fiat money? Uh, and these are basically rising debt ratio causing an increase in the claim of non-producers on the economy, frontiers rather than capitalists or workers. Uh, the workers copying it because they, get the, they, they end up being the residual class in society, even if they're not doing any of the borrowing money. And what you've ended up with is a level of financial leverage far beyond anything capitalism has experienced beforehand. This is now looking at America and the UK over the last 130, 140 years. And it's clearly obvious that the UK's debt's higher than it's ever had in its history. The same thing applies to America. Okay. So we're actually in the highest level of private debt in the history of humanity. And that's partly why there's such an interest in alternative currencies now. So the core problem with finance is not that interest is charged, which is the Islamic approach to it. I get the same results out of the Islamic system. It's, it's so simple to make money. Now, I don't mean making a profit. We know that's hard. Earning a wage, that can be hard as well. Uh, but it's really, really easy to make money. And my favourite example of how easy it is to make money is this guy, who was a service station, petrol station owner in New Zealand. And he applied for a $100,000 overdraft from the Westpac Bank. And, oh, but dear, they made a mistake. They gave him $10 million instead. He left the country. I can see, he, he told his girlfriend when he found the amount of money in his account when he opened up the bank account the next day, we're fucking rich. <laughs> and uh, he, he took off to another country, which was China. So what happened was, well, he asked for $100,000, which is one zero 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 decimal point, double zero. Who's worked in a bank? Have you seen the keyboards that have double zeros on them? The clerk either forgot to press the decimal point or it was jammed. Let's say he didn't press the decimal point. That means one less keystroke created 100 times as much money. 11% effort, 100 times as much output. There's no other industry to which that applies. So we have to socially control this industry, which we haven't done. So what you've done with Bitcoin is replace the trusted third party bit with a trusted algorithm. Untrusted individuals, a trusted algorithm, which is still its own issue. I'm, I can understand the logic of that, but there are issues about it which I'm still exploring, and one of them was the whole idea of, first of all, the analogy with gold. It's a mistake. You okay? should never have based it on something like gold. It should be something you can continue producing. And it's both logically wrong as a model of money, and it's also logically wrong as a model of gold. Do you know how to make gold? really simple. It was done a few days ago, or maybe a few hundred, a few billion years ago. We saw it a few days ago. You collide two neutron stars together and part of the, the, the energy released of that comes out as gold and it gets blasted in the rest of the universe and lands on a lump of rocks and becomes part of the planet Earth or some other planet. So it's rather hard to make gold. Now it's very easy to make another digital currency. That's one of my first issues about it. But the one I've only realised recently is the energy consumption levels. You would have all seen this article. Okay. One transaction, whatever that means, whether that means extending the block, the, uh, the, the chain of transactions or mining, etc., etc. And when I made a comment about that on my blog, I got a repost from one of my supporters on Patreon, Colin Green here, and he made the point that I'm, it's, the energy situation isn't as dire as I'm making out. So I want to just explore that one here. He's saying the maximum energy possible is given by taking the total mining reward, which is roughly, say, 2,000 Bitcoin a day, multiplying by the market rate, which was 6,000 when you wrote it, it's now 8,000, isn't it? Close? Okay. 
and then you spend all that on energy. You said, well, that's a lot of energy. Yeah, that's true. But he said the per block reward will eventually drop to zero, leaving only transaction fee income. Anybody agree with that? Disagree? Okay. I want to explore what that actually means. And he's also talking about competition, meaning cheaper energy sources. Maybe we'll start building Bitcoin farms powered by solar energy in the, in the, in the Sahara Desert, something of that nature. Now, what does that imply in terms of the current performance of Bitcoin? Because if you look at the Bitcoin price since it began, there was one huge bubble back in 2013, and now the one you're in right now. It's only, I think it's in about, well, look at March of this year that you exceeded the previous peak, which was back in about November of 2013. <coughs> You've got to see it on a log scale as well to get the better idea of that. So, you know, it's taken, there's been a three year period where prices were falling for a while, then rising very slowly. Now they're rising virtually hyper exponentially. What that implies in terms of a percentage rate of growth of prices, ah, I wanted to animate that as I normally do. You had a, a maximum rate of price change of 9,000% on an annual basis. You're currently running at about, about 1,000% which is huge, and that's fantastic. Anybody who's got Bitcoin is really, really happy about that. Um, but that's hyperdeflation, which means a rising, massively rising value of what... I've got question marks there because they don't regard Bitcoin as money. I'll explain why. Now, we all know the experience of hyperinflation. And of course, when hyperinflation happens, yes, you got, you got paid a, in, a, in a wheelbarrow, but you raced off to the shop. You had to spend it. Because if you didn't, it would be worth far less you know, a, a half an hour later. So that gives you massive need to shop. But if you have hyperdeflation, will you ever shop? It's actually a very negative force for, for shopping. Would you buy a house with Bitcoin right now? Would you even buy a cup of coffee? Because if you look at the relative price of both consumer goods and assets to Bitcoin <coughs> in the last uh, two years... Uh, if you'd bought a house back in 2016 with Bitcoin, you could have bought two and a half houses today. So you wouldn't buy it. You'll hang on to the Bitcoin. That's a very strong incentive not to use it for transactions. Now, back to that whole definition of, of what is money. Uh, I focused on that three-sided part of it, but if you look at Graziani again, he says money has to be accepted as a means of final settlement of the transaction. Now, if there are no transactions, it's not money. Now, if you do start having transactions, this is the point here, it's why I raised what do people think about this. If the per block reward drops to zero and there's only transaction fee left, what's going to happen to the price of Bitcoin? If the main demand is for it is because you expect the price to continue rising, what happens if the price stops rising? How far could the price fall? You've got to catch 22. The rising value right now means you're all getting nice and wealthy using it but you wouldn't use it for transactions. If he's going to use it for transactions, then the price has to stop rising. If it stops rising, will it just stop or will it fall? Okay. You've had a previous experience of it falling quite dramatically. So can Bitcoin become money? And what is it if it can't? Maybe it's this. Okay, let's have a chat about that. Thank you.
but in a world of, of almost costless computing, if there was a structure that didn't involve so much centralization of the mining, mm. the velocity of money would be so high that functionally the supply would be infinite. Um, it wouldn't be infinite. I think um, back to the, where the money is gold. Money's never been, never, money's never systematically been gold. The few occasions which they found that people demanded gold in payment rather than money, where money meant uh, uh, either a, a coin stamped by the king of the realm or a tally stick, which was by far the major form of money. You know what tally sticks are? Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, tally sticks were by far the major form of credit. They all got destroyed in the House of Parliament back in 1873, I think, and it burnt the House of Parliament down as well. 1834, I think it was. Yeah. Um, so gold was only used when you had such a degree of conflict between kingdoms that nobody trusted the king would be alive to honour the debt in his own coin. So at that stage, mercenaries fighting like the Thirty Years' War and the Hundred Years' War, they demanded payment in gold or silver. So that's the, one of the few occasions that gold and silver has been money at any point in history. So the gold is a, is a bad analogy. Banks create money by double entry bookkeeping. They simply say, that's a great idea to pay a million pounds for that house in, in Birmingham, or Brum, don't you call it? Okay. Buy that house in Brum for a million, here's a million pounds, by the way you owe us a million pounds. They expand the assets and liabilities stage of their side of their banking account simultaneously. And the limit to what they can do with that is the level of equity they've currently got. The actual the difference between assets minus liabilities is bank equity, and banks have to have positive equity. If a bank goes to negative equity, it is bankrupt. So that's they can expand it, and the temptation they have is to go from a low level of gearage, like say, you know, five to one or ten to one ratio between equity and assets, and ten and twenty and thirty to one, which is what we allowed to have happen under the, the financial bubble of the subprimes. And then, of course, assets are incredibly fungible in terms of price. Asset prices can plunge like a brick. And that's all it takes for a bank to go bankrupt. So the, the danger of that system is the fragility and the ease with which the money is created and the temptation banks have to create the money and take fees out of it and get the hell out of there before it all blows up. Whether they know that's going to happen or not, some of them are a bit like some discussions I heard here in terms of awareness of how their own system works. Uh, but that's the... The, the, the part of it. So you, you'd never use gold for physical transactions, of course. I mean, the amount of gold in the world apparently is equivalent to about two swimming pools. I wouldn't mind owning one of the pools, <laughs> but it's not anything like substantial enough to be based on, on, on commerce. So the idea of a, bit of a, of a digital version of that, the, the, the untrust, no need for trust, the algorithm to size the trust, et cetera, et cetera. That's more fungible, more movable than gold, which I think is a, a sensible thing. But I would have designed a system with, a, with an increasing amount of it being produced every year and then distribute that. The question, how do you distribute it right now? How do you actually get Bitcoin? You've got to buy it with fiat money, haven't you? Okay. Um, that is not exactly solving the problems of the fiat money system if you need fiat money to get into the game in the first place. So the distribution of income you've got as a problem right now is, is just transferred across to the Bitcoin world with a bit of it going to outer Mongolia. Is that a reasonable answer? or? Well, it, the, the one thing that was missing from that was the... Um, yeah. To do with the, the, the divergence in incentives between the people who administer the yeah. scheme and the people who are trying to use the scheme. Yeah. So the miners effectively are the... Um, if you think of it as triple entry bookkeeping, yeah. uh, they're the, the, uh, the line thing that sits over the top, or at least they run that part of the system. Mm. If you take a model that continues to create uh, tokens like Ethereum, yeah. Ethereum is designed not as a store of value, but as a medium of... Transactions. Well, even, yeah. not even that, but a medium of um, uh, distributing the trust across the network yeah. in a uh, peer-to-peer rather than a server-client model. So mm. you don't have, in, if, when it's finished, um, because we can, the Ethereum um, system continues to produce coins uh, over the long term, okay. and um, people can run those in their pockets instead of having to have them on specialized computers. Mm. The people who run the system and use the system are the same people, so they don't have a divergence of interest. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a worthwhile um, variation compared to Bitcoin, which I think was just too much based on a meta analogy to gold and mining. So, which one is size of the
Thank you for giving the talk. My question is, do you think Bitcoin and the whole cryptocurrency space in general is in a bubble? Yes, I do think it's in a bubble. And looking at that price level a moment ago, let's go back and take a look at it. Um, you know, you've had one bubble, obviously, and it burst, obviously, uh, back in 2013. That rate of increase now is almost a factor of 10 increase over a year. That's got, to, that's got to be a bubble. You're buying in because you expect the price to rise. And that's a positive feedback loop, and they always break. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you're basing that on things that actually bring in new producers to produce things because the price is high. It doesn't apply to Bitcoin, my argument, and that is the current thing. Speaking of the other market, all bubbles collapse because prices are high, increases producers to produce things, mm -hmm. which therefore overs the supply and then collapses. That's the, the classic sort of function. Mm -hmm. That can't, doesn't apply to Bitcoin, where because the supply is limited. And people are speculating that green, but they still drive up the price all the time. They are producing up, but if yeah. someone's not going to be able to come in and reproduce more bitcoins to satisfy that price, because that, that's, that's an additional reason why bitcoin would burst rather. Uh, okay, so increasing supply yeah. can burst a bubble, but normally yeah. what stops it is the end of the demand. Yes. Okay, well, and that's no different here. Yes. Uh, you know, this looks like the tulip price bubble to me. But a lot of those, yes, but that, we, we okay. can go into that one. Okay. But but my argument was hmm. that actually most bubbles collapse actually because people are expecting high prices. Uh, uh, they either they either um, those 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 those, those uh, expectations are wrong. It, it right? wasn't an excess of tulips that ended the tulip bubble. No, no, no. Okay, it's 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 getting to a point where people look at the, it's basically if you're going to buy into this market, like in the, when you're looking at tulips and so on, and I think arguably Bitcoin as well, you're going to be borrowing money to do it. Yeah. They look at the entry costs get to be so high, the number of people who and the people who the number of people who haven't yet been bought in starts falling. It's like an epidemiology effect. The decline in the number of people that can get infected means the rate of growth of the infection slows down. When it does, the bubble bursts. Yeah. So I still think that's a one thousand a one thousand percent increase in one year. Yes. But, but, if you, but if you go back to what Jamie Dyer said, what he said was a junior bubble. He said it could go to a hundred thousand. It could go to two hundred. Yeah, it can keep on going, and it's not saying it's going to fall tomorrow. Yeah. The are so tiny and tiny. But, but I'm looking at also what I'd see as the fundamental value here, and the fundamental value of ultimately would be its use in transactions. Now, its use in transactions is not going to be priced at eight thousand dollars, eight thousand dollars per per Bitcoin. So, what's what 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 would the sustainable price be if you're using it for transactions rather than a profitable mining? And I think it'd be a lot lower than eight thousand. Exactly. So, what you're saying is. Is the utility, the transactional value, can it catch up to the price quickly enough? I don't. Do well, think? I mean, the, the amount of energy being used, that's another ridiculous thing. The energy consumption, I know, yes, there are, you know, you've got to pay for security guards and clerks and buildings and lights, etc., etc. But this is the last time we need to be inventing a financial system that loses large amounts of energy and produces large amounts of carbon dioxide. That's not exactly what the planet needs right now. My next question. Hi, uh, Stuart. I was having a talk earlier and, and picked up on some of the David Graeber stuff, and then but was trying to outline that I agree with you with the Bitcoin just doesn't seem to be very functional as a currency, but I thought the cryptocurrencies themselves could allow us to sort of model a currency beyond the system that we've got at the moment. So my question to you is, how would we respond to the current monetary system? Possibly using cryptocurrency or otherwise to become, to become more equal and more you know, sustainable to the planet. I had a bit of a challenge here in standing your voice just there, oh, but sorry. I was going to try to just say the last bit a bit more slowly because my hearing is a bit challenged on this. Yeah, give your opinion. Your question was, what would you change about the current monetary system to? Uh, it'll be more equal and, be more equal. and be better for the planet. And yeah, I, I, I would like to see. I, I think there's potential in the cryptocurrency world to produce something as an alternative to money. Okay, but you have to design it on the basis of what money is and where the money should grow. I think a lot of the cryptocurrency people believe that the real danger of money is hyperinflation. So let's actually set up a system that can't inflate. In fact, yes, hyperinflation is a danger, but it's normally occurring when, when productive systems are being destroyed. 
It's a combination. It isn't just a case of the government printing money, it's also the government losing half its territory, which is the case for the Weimar Republic, or having massive reparations and so on. Those are the sort of instances that give us hyperinflation. A small amount of inflation and a small rate of growth of the money supply is a sensible thing when you have a growing economy. So I think trying to avoid hyperinflation, you've been so successful in the wrong direction, you've got hyperdeflation, which means it can't be used for transactions. So you need something of that system which is low cost, low energy cost in particular, has the trust levels that you've built in with the algorithms. That could be a, a viable alternative once people start accepting it because, again, one of Harman Minsky's points was to say anybody can create money, the hard part is getting it accepted. Once this got accepted as a cheap way of financing transactions and it was reliable for the long term, it could work. But at the moment, I certainly don't believe Bitcoin is like that and I've still got to learn about other <coughs> cryptocurrencies. Well, we'll have two more, then we're going to have a break and then we'll get to the panel discussion. Okay, and who's next? Okay, Hi, I'm Sebastian Ewan. I'm a paediatrician and trustee of Time Banking UK. And I'm interested in currency for social good, and it's related to the last question, but how do you see opportunities for a currency enabling social good as opposed to just being an investment? Yeah, this is a big question, uh, because at the moment it's all about an investment. Um, I know there's some people working on an idea of a social good. The major factor you've got to look at is the extent to which you can generate destructive inequality and also destructive industries. And that can happen even with a, a simple exchange monetary system. Um, if, you, if you imagine, if you, if you have everybody exchanging tokens with each other, and one of us is Beyonce and the other is a lot of us, the rest of us are not, Beyonce is going to get a lot more tokens than we do. You get a very unequal distribution. The question is, it goes so far that it affects the viability of the people on the bottom, and does it also give you, you know, the concentration of wealth, at least a social breakdown? We've, we've got both those factors right now times 10 with the current financial system. So if you, if you address yourself to those issues and say, can we design a system which um, lets inequality get to a level where people are inspired to take risks, which is an important part of a, a functional capitalist system, but not so far that you get it turning into another feudalist system, which is where we've ended up right now. And I think that's still a lot of people in, in Bitcoin world are hoping to become you know, king and queen of their own domain. So you can do it, but you haven't done it yet. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, so banks create credit out of all the assets they have, stocks and whatever they have. What, what do you think about the idea of using Bitcoin as collateral to create money, like dollars and pounds? Um, I'm not so much Bitcoin, but I know the Bank of England's working on a digital currency of its own. And I quite like that idea because one thing I want to do, I mean, I'll show you the levels of debt a short while ago, so if I can find that particular graph. The main cause of the financial crisis was too much private debt. In fact, it was also used for speculation on asset prices rather than producing goods and services, another part of it. But that's the real cause. We've got to get that down. Now, the reason the central banks went for quantitative easing is that's what they're used to doing, buying bonds off the financial sector because they, they don't have accounts for us at the central bank. But if the Bank of England sets up a digital accounting system, we could all find ourselves having a bank account at the Bank of England, backed by cryptocurrency, where the Bank of England is a trusted party at the top, so it would be a trusted cryptocurrency system. And they could put money inside there, which could be used either to pay down private debt or to buy shares, which would be used to cancel corporate debt. So that's a development which I think could mean you get a, a way of using the, bit, the blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies combined with the current banking system to reduce the level of private debt and liberate the economy from this debt trap. All right, so now we're going to have a short break before we set up the chairs for the panel discussion. And then we'll have Steve King and other speakers back for that. So for the time being, Professor Steve, a big round of applause. Thank you.